Good morning. My name is Angelina Carlson. I'm the founder of Legacy Planning, a boutique coaching and advisory firm based out of Beverly Hills, California. This morning, I have the pleasure of welcoming Eric Brotman to this Legacy Series conversation. So Mr. Brotman is the Chief Executive Officer of BFG Financial Advisors, an independent firm assisting clients with wealth creation, preservation, and distribution. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Pennsylvania, and he is the host of Don't Retire, Graduate. Welcome, Eric. Thanks, Angelina. It's great to be here. What a lovely surprise to be able to converse with you about wealth management. I understand you're both a financial planner and you also um, help with um, affluent individuals. So should, should I start with how you began to build your legacy or where would you like to begin this lovely morning? You know, ultimately, ultimately I'm comfortable with any direction you'd like to go, but we can start with, uh, with my background. I'm happy to share that. Um, you know, I, I started in the financial industry in 1994, um, which feels like the dark ages now. I mean, we have, we have employees working for us who weren't born at the time, which is shocking. Um, but this was an industry that was really not, not doing a great service for, for consumers. Um, okay. It was really, it was extremely predatory. Uh, it still is in some ways. Um, and it caters to a finite population in ways that I think are incredibly challenging. So what I mean by that is a lot of times there is a focus and almost like a, uh, like sharks in the water going after these high net worth families. And there's only so many. Okay. When, when actually the masses really do need financial planning. And so we've, we've created a, a program that allows just about any family to do financial planning and to do it in a way that's affordable. We still have services, wealth, wealth management services for high net worth families, but we can also meet other families where they are. And so we have a deep team that can, that can really start to create abundance mentality among folks who maybe aren't uh, served properly. So would you say that the predatory aspect had to do with the lack of education, the lack of full disclosure? Well, disclosure is not helping. I mean, if, if you've read a prospectus, you're the one. Um, okay. Because unfortunately, all the disclosure in this industry that's been created by the lawyers is hundreds of pages of legalese. It's, it's the same as when you, you download a new app and you agree to accept whatever they're sending to you. You're not scrolling and reading that ever. And sure. you've just agreed to everything. Well, so this industry does the same thing. And then it, it looks to cover its bases by saying, well, on page 77, it said this. Right, right. And, and, and it's very sneaky. I can't stand that. Yeah. Well, so kudos to you that you're bringing this transparency and breaking it down into bite-sized bits so the average regular person can understand that's busy working and busy doing other things. Because I know that with the affluent, they might work 40 or 60 hours a week, but then they delegate the task of... Um, you know, wealth preservation and wealth building to an individual, but, but for everybody else, they need to understand what's the, what's in the fine print. And you're right. People don't read what's in, um, uh, you know, that phone book that they get when they purchase a property, they don't even read the, the policy notices from the utility companies. So yes, all of that is just, mm -hmm. yeah, people gloss over and then they wonder what happens when the rates go up or, or when their uh, mortgage resets. Right. Well, and, and we've seen this throughout history. We've seen this go, go poorly. In the great financial crisis, we saw it go poorly with negative amortized mortgages, um, where folks did not realize that they were actually paying less than even the, the payment and that their balance was going up every month, not down, and that it was going to reset. And it, it was extraordinarily predatory. And it wasn't all the fault of the banks. It took lots of parties to mess this up, including the federal government, which is almost always a party to bad ideas. <laughs> but, but that's a show for another time. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the the fine print, not, no one reads it. If you buy or sell a home and you're going to the settlement table and you have to go get your your title work done, it's 150 pages and you're signing 48 of them. Mm. And there's no way you can't possibly either. First of all, you can't read it. Second of all, if you read it, you won't understand it. And third of all, if you do read it and you do understand it, you're not going to do anything about it. Right, right. Because the attorneys so, are writing the contract. Correct. So it's, it's a unilateral contract. You're not going to say, look, I object to this paragraph. I'm not buying the house. Correct. It just doesn't happen. So you're over the barrel with all these transactions. And so what I find is important is it's important to have an advocate. It's important to have folks who truly are on the same side of the table as you are in every way possible. 
this is an industry that's fraught with conflicts of interest. And there's a, there's been a history of trying to disclose away those conflicts. Whereas I think it's better to face it like any other ethical or moral dilemma in our lives and just say, here's, here's the rub. Here's why this is a challenge. Here's where, where all of us are. Let's make a good decision. Let's make sure it's your decision and let's make sure it's an educated decision. Kudos to you. And what value do you get to honor by doing this? I'm, I'm sorry. What, what value, value do I get to honor? Yes. I, the, the, the honor of uh, the value of integrity. Yeah. The, 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 I mean, I, I want to be able to sleep at night and I want to know that I've done the right thing in every case, even if it's unpopular, okay. even if it's even if it's not as profitable. Yeah. I mean, I, I figure if we take incredible care of people um, and we do the right thing such as and, and, and not to be cliche, but if we were on the if every decision we made was on the front page of the paper, would we be embarrassed by it? Because if we would be, that's a decision we must make. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, kudos to you again for that, uh, for that uh, honesty that, um, and I might also use the word altruism, that you care about your customer in the long run and building those relationships. Because some individuals see business as transaction oriented and others get that it's a long-term relationship that we need to foster and nurture and contribute to and give to and yes. Well, especially in our financial world where the relationship isn't necessarily one generation. You Correct. know, Correct. we work with families that are two and three and four generations where we get to really create um, not only affluence and abundance, but joy in a lot of ways where you get to see the fruits of your labor make a giant difference for the people you love the most. And so we talk about legacy all the time. We talk about, you know, how do you want to be remembered? It's not about stuff. It, it's never about stuff. It's not the chafing dish that's going to bust up Halloween. Yeah. Halloween. I just said Halloween because we just did that. Thanksgiving is what I meant. That's really funny. Yeah. Halloween not impacted by a chafing dish. Yeah, you're absolutely right. People don't right. remember that. Right. Right. Um, so I, I'm going to get into a moment how your parents were smart enough to prepare a whole life policy. But I will agree with you first that I think it, it um, you're right. People remember the memories. They remember the, 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 the stories and the moments, not just the annuity. Definitely. And the experience. Right. right. On, on my father's side of the family, his grandfather Herbert was um, an insurance broker very successful one during the Great Depression oh, and boy. did very well for himself he had multiple properties and he drove mm -hmm. Cadillacs but the stories were always about how he flirted with waitresses and how happy he was <laughs> well right uh, so that's it, good right so so the memory is that he was happy but it, it wasn't that um, you know he was a Scrooge or that it, it, it wasn't it, it was that he treated people well and he loved people and he was larger than life and his personality and, and that, that love just emulated out from his heart space. I, I love that. That's a great story. And, and it's true. The, the people will never, ever remember what you say. They'll remember how you make them feel. Yes. And that's a hundred percent true. And treating people, you can tell a lot about somebody um, when you see how they treat someone who is, uh, who is serving them dinner or who is, uh, you know, or who is rotating their tires. Right. I mean, correct. You, you, you really can tell a lot about the character of a person by how they treat folks who um, who might be invisible or anonymous otherwise. Yeah, powerful. Very wise. OK, so let's talk about your parents. So yeah. it appears that you started building your legacy with the head start that your parents provided by the whole life policy. So how did they know? My father was um, he was an attorney. Okay. He was an insurance broker and, and he had been an investment advisor. So he had sort of worn lots of hats and been in a number of different places. Um, and he was just a believer in um, life insurance as an asset class and as a, a good piece of property to own. And so my folks bought an insurance policy for me when I was a teenager, I was a young kid. And some people find that creepy. I, I don't. They were never hoping to collect on that benefit, thankfully, and they haven't. I'm still here. Um, but nonetheless, they bought that for me when I was a kid. And then when I was an adult, they transferred that to me and it became part of my responsibility at that point. And it was a very helpful piece of collateral because when I was 25 years old, I bought my first home and I had a decent income. I could afford a payment, but I didn't have a down payment. Mm -hmm. I hadn't been able to save enough to get in the door right. and the life insurance policy became the collateral I needed to buy my first home and it saved the day. And when I look at 
how much profit was made on that first home when I sold it 12 years later. In Baltimore, I, Maryland. Co- ke- ke- correct, in Maryland. <laughs> I can attribute that to... I can attribute that to if I hadn't had that life insurance policy that my folks paid a few hundred dollars for when I was a kid, um, I might not have been in that home and I might not have made that money. Now, I paid that back. I used it as collateral. I paid it back. And then fast forward to 2003, I had been in this industry almost nine years and I was going to start a company. And no bank, despite deposits or relationships with them, no bank is going to lend money to a startup. It's It's incredibly difficult as a... So I, I had to borrow money from everywhere. Mm-hmm. I borrowed money from my home. I borrowed it from my life insurance. I borrowed it from my mother. Let me tell you, I paid mom back first. If there's ever one place you need to keep a good line of credit, it's right there. But I borrowed <laughs> money from every place and the life insurance really made a huge difference again. And now 18 years later, we have this spectacular business. Banks that would ignore us when I was trying to are now tripping over themselves for our business, which is ironic and funny. Mm-hmm. Um, and if it hadn't been for you know my father's foresight to do that, I may or may not have had the startup capital I needed. And I certainly didn't want to do all of it on Visa. That is, that is not the way to start a company if you can help it. Sure, at 16% APR or something like that. Right, right. right. So, so note to all the parents that are listening, right? The young parents out there, get a whole life policy for your children. <laughs> well, and, and and look, one size never fits all. So, it, you know, I don't think that that is necessarily the first thing that you ought to do. It It's like the airplane safety lecture when you fly and they say, if, uh, if in a loss of cabin pressure, first put on your own masks. Right, right. Um, we encourage lots of parents and grandparents to do this, but only if they've already taken care of their own plan, their own financial independence plan. It doesn't right. make sense to have kids who are financially stable and to have you unstable and having to live with one of them. Right. So first make sure you've taken care of yourself. Absolutely. I just think that this education, this conversation today is vitally important because if we're not having these conversations um, in school, whether it's public or private school, and we're not having them obviously at the, the church, the synagogue, the temple, the, you know, it, because it, it, you know, some people don't want to discuss money at those, those locations. So it's like, where do people learn if it's not for podcasts or some other form forum or format where somebody can say, Hey, here's a concept and an idea. Let's redirect your energy here because in the long run, it's going to be a, a benefit, like you said, not just here and now, but for generations to come. Because not only did that help you build a business, but it's helping you elevate other individuals, whether that's your closest circle, whether that's your children, which we'll get to in a moment, or, or, or your clients even in mm-hmm. you know leading one to lead another and so forth. There's no question that's true. And, and when, you, when you look at financial literacy, which really is a, a serious problem, Right. It, it, if the financials today are, are very complicated, we're not talking about balancing a checkbook. We're talking about a lot of very complicated transactions and sometimes even micro transactions. And just signing up for employee benefits when you get a job is like an undertaking. And, and I don't know about you, but the first, my first job, I got handed like a hundred pages of stuff and they were like, we need this back Friday. Right. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm looking at. I haven't even figured out how to rent my first apartment yet. And you're asking me to make these decisions, you know? Uh, And so we've actually created a financial literacy course. It's an online course and it's free for anyone who wants to take it. And we've, we've had uh, a lot of folks do that. And we've heard that it's been great for middle and high school students, college students, and just young adults who want a refresher. Right. Um, And so we've built these resources because not everyone can afford a financial planner, Right. but everyone needs financial literacy. Good for you. And I think those fundamentals, the more that people hear them and they see them and they they speak them, that practice then can become a part of our vocabulary and not something that's so foreign and far away out there. Yes. Agreed. Yes. Yeah, I agree. And I'm going to move on to the second question in a moment, but they say that the millennials are the most educated these days. I don't know if that's true or not, just because I read a statistic and some media publication, but I'd like to think that they've got the hunger and the curiosity to research with all of the resources that are available on the internet today. Millennials have um, functionally changed the world in a lot of ways, but most profoundly, they're the first generation that realized that they're on their own. You know, that, 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 you know, the greatest generation still believed the government would somehow take care of them through social security and other benefits. Um, and then the boomers, most of them at least thought they were going to have pensions. Mm-hmm. Um, Gen Xers, uh, you know, I'm a proud Gen Xer, despite being the, the baby bust and being that little tiny group. 
that we'll never have power. We just always will do what the boomers want and then we'll do what the millennials want because we're just this little, we're just being pulled in, in both directions. But millennials figured out that you're on your own. They figured out that, that you, having a side hustle made a difference because when, when you change jobs or, or lose a job, mm -hmm. it's important to have a, a fallback income. Correct. Millennials figured that out. Others are doing it now. I mean, boomers are consulting and doing other stuff, but it, it was the millennials that figured that out. And I love to pick on millennials because they're millennials and they're easy to pick on, but they did that right. They did that really well. And they're bright because they're picking up on the landscape. Well, and they know no one is here to help them. Yeah. Literally, yeah. And, they're, and they're, they're, there is no, the safety nets are frayed at best. So you're really on your own and they know they have to take care of themselves. And, you know, as they, as they age and millennials aren't children, millennials right. are, 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 you know, middle-aged adults now at some point, depending how you define that. Correct. Yeah. And it's interesting because the, the, the profile of who watches these videos are under age 40, mostly, mostly. Okay. Yeah. And I found that fascinating because I, I thought it would be over age 40 and it's, and it's the young ones. There's an incredible appetite to, to, um, to really gobble up information and, and education. And, right. the, the, and it's not just millennials. These are the same way. And my daughter, who is 11, can research anything and find anything in ways that when I was 11, I could only dream of that just didn't exist. And she can find anything instantly. And it's, it's no longer about um, remembering information. Now it's about knowing how to access it and what to do with it when you get it. It's a different skill set. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. So coaches in my past have told me, plan your life. Is this something that you have done? Uh, I've done as best I can. Uh, I took a, I was part of the leadership Maryland program class of 2009. And when I did that program, uh, our facilitator, um, who's a, a brilliant guy had us build a timeline for our lives. And, and it forced us to not only conjure up our own mortality, but also to conjure up the things we wanted to do in between. And it was much more than a bucket list. I still don't believe a bucket list is the right solution because if you pick five things you want to do before you die and you finish those five things, you have a problem. Right, um, right. I, I think it's really about, um, it, it's about living a life with purpose. It's about making a difference in every interaction you have with people, hopefully a positive difference. Um, and it's about, it, you know, it's about finding what you're passionate about and doing it. And I don't care if you're, if you're 40 or 80. And I think financial independence is a part of that process. Financial independence means that now you're working because you want to, if you're working at all, you're working because you want to, not because you have to. And there's a completely different mindset when you're, when you're doing something you love and, it, and it's creating wealth for you, as opposed to when you're punching a clock, hating something and, and you can't wait till five o'clock. Right, right. One is that fulfillment and joy, the other one is mi misery. Right, right. Yes, and there's, yeah. there's a lot of very sad people out there working jobs they hate because they feel stuck. Correct. Correct. And that's, that's tragic to me. Because it could have been avoided if only they had known how to handle it. Maybe. Maybe it was an educational issue. Maybe it's a parenting issue. I mean, you know, college isn't for everyone and it doesn't need to be for everyone. And I think we're figuring that out. There are lots of paths um, to success and to entrepreneurship and other things. But um, having some kind of plan to be upwardly mobile matters. Sure. And there's sure. lots of paths. There is no one way to do it. Correct. Correct. So in the distinction between, and I'd love your input on this, in the distinction mm -hmm. between the middle class and the affluent, do you think that there is a distinction regarding how financially educated they are? Do you think that the affluent are more financially educated or do you think they just have more access to resources or do you think it's a level playing field today where any surprise could come along? All right, well, it's definitely not a level playing field. Let's throw that out immediately. Um, the access to information, advice, resources, and opportunities amplifies exponentially as you become wealthier. There's no question that's true. Um, I don't think it's about formal education, though. I don't think any of these folks are necessarily more educated than the other formally. But people who are, uh, people who are of means, whatever that means to you, are more likely to have learned some of those lessons, um, at least from their family. And if not, they have the resources to pay for advice. Mm. Um, and, and I would tell you that the, the middle class in this country, um, and I can't speak to the rest of the world, but in the U.S., the middle class is, is really disappearing. 
Well, I was going to say that they're shrinking today, but we're going to talk about that in a moment. But keep yeah, going, yeah. please. No, it's, it's, a, it's a troubling thing because it's extremely difficult when you're teetering one missed paycheck from oblivion. Correct. And, and that sums up uh, uh, probably, uh, and I don't know statistically, but I'd bet you it's more than half the households in this country are one missed paycheck away from a serious problem. Right, right. Yeah, it's a, it's a sobering conversation. And I think that people want solutions. And I think that's a part of the motivation to go onto the internet and find the, the education and the data and the, the online courses. And because they're, they, want, they want to get out of being stuck. It's true, but it's also difficult to tell what is legitimate and what is garbage. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, if, if saying I saw it on the internet, so it must be true is like when I grew up, <laughs> if it was on TV, it was true. Yes. But that was an advertisement for something. It, 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 the, it just because it's online does not make it true in any way, shape or form. You have to consider the source, the context and everything else. Correct. Which means you have to be savvy enough to discern the real logical financial advice and what is uh, a sales pitch that's thinly veiled yes. as, as financial advice. And, and, and it's very tough to tell the difference. You have to be a savvy consumer and that makes us all cynics. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Trust is hard these days. It's, it's hard to build. It's, um, it's not hard to keep. It's hard to build. It's responsible to keep. It's impossible to rebuild. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you, this, this is your one shot. If you blow that, particularly doing what we do for a living, if we were to violate someone's trust, it, we're done. It's it. Okay. Very insightful. Okay. So um, in the distinction between financial planning and wealth management, how do these two approaches affect or influence individual or family legacies, if at all? I, I, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of nomenclature thrown out that, you know, everybody and their, and their brother-in-law called themselves financial advisors for a long time. And there were a lot of designations and what is a, a true financial advisor and so forth. Um, to me, the difference between financial planning and wealth management is like the difference between having a primary care physician or a concierge physician. Ah. To, to me, the difference isn't whether you're getting medical advice and it isn't whether you're getting medical advice from a trusted professional. It's whether you're getting medical advice with a different level, a different service component, maybe a different level of handholding. Okay. You know, so uh, in a financial planning arrangement, um, an advisor might say, uh, Angelina, as my client now, um, I think it's really important that you go out and redo your estate documents. You need a new will and so forth. Um, so go do that and send it to us. In a wealth management engagement, we're going to say, do you have an attorney? If you do, we'd like to sit down with him or her, or we'll help you find one and we'll all do a meeting together and we'll make sure this gets done so that it's coordinated. In both cases, you're getting financial advice. In both cases, you're getting a will. Correct. In one case, you're getting a more integrated approach and a more hands-on experience. Some people want that and some people don't. I mean, it's not uh, that one is better than the other. It, it just, it depends. It's, it's like if you join a gym, okay. you can choose to hire a trainer or not you're still going to get a workout. Right. Yes. But there's, a, but yeah, there is definitely a distinction. And, and, and so I, what I have found in the last 10 years, people are starting uh, to not only care more about their finances as they realize the government's not going to take care of them, but I, but I've also found in the last 10 years, the word legacy popping up more and more, whether that is the financial houses or common conversation people before thought a legacy could only be available to let's call it old money. Mm -hmm. And now I'm seeing statistics that today's new wealth or um, today's affluent, two thirds of them are self-made. So even this idea of building a legacy means that they're going to have to either design it themselves or mm -hmm. um, be the first of their family line to create something, whether that's with their attorney, with their financial advisor. I mean, I, I, I would think that you're also seeing this word pop up more and more. Well, we, we, we ask about legacy in every client engagement. It's something okay. we, we invite, whether, whether it's been brought up or not, we, we help people think about it because I think it is important. I don't think legacy requires wealth. I think there are lots of different kinds of ways to leave a legacy. They don't have to be financial. Oh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yes. But, but most people, if you go to the grocery store, they, they won't say to their neighbor or, or whoever, they, they think it's only for certain families. If you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right. And, and so that's, 
I think, uh, uh, I, I think that's something we need to dispel. I think that's a myth. Yes. Yes. You know, it, it might be that, uh, uh, you know, we, we use a company called Acknowledge Media, and I, I think they're amazing, and they do legacy videos for folks, usually older people, who want to tell their stories on video in a digital way. It's a type of immortality, but it's a, it's a love letter of sorts to your heirs, even the ones you may never meet. Correct. And it's incredibly powerful. I had both of my parents do one. I gave them gifts, and I said, Mom and Dad, this is going to be the most selfish gift I ever give because it's really for me and for my daughter, you know, my my father-in-law died when my daughter was young and she doesn't remember him. And he's not in any of the pictures because he always had the camera. I see things that mistakes that you make. And that has nothing to do with wealth. That's just something we don't think about because none of us expect tomorrow to be the last day on earth. Correct. Correct. So wealthier people can afford to do those kinds of things. Right. But folks with less means can can handwrite that love letter. They, it's called an ethical will. I mean, you can you can take pen to paper. You can take photographs. You, you can even if you're just telling stories, there are ways to pass that in thousands of years. And so I think it's important to let people know what your vision is, what your values are and how you want to be remembered. Yes. Well, I'm loving that there are those resources today, because one of the questions I had in the past year or two was, how come my grandparents and great grandparents didn't leave me a note? And the answer is they didn't know to. Right. Yeah. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't something people talked about. Correct. Um, and, yes. And, and I never met my great grandparents. And I know stories about them because I heard my grandparents tell them, but my daughters never even heard those stories. Because once you get a couple of generations away, it's not relevant. It doesn't even feel there's no attachment to it. Yes. But it still affects us, whether that's it it does affect us. But having the video to be able to say this was your grandfather. Yeah, is a very cool thing. Or this was your grandmother. Um, And to have stories told in their own words. And and if if it's not video, it's it's truly it's that letter. If somebody says, Angelina, this is what I want you to remember about us as your loving grandparents and, you know, and, and a little bit about their history and their story and what they wanted for you. Yes. I think also just understanding the context of their life makes it mm-hmm. feel like it's not so far away. Yeah. All right. Deep, yeah. deep, good stuff. Okay. Well, I'm glad that it's a part of more and more of the financial conversations. Mm-hmm. And also that you're highlighting the point that um, it can be available to anyone. Anyone. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyone. We all have a past. We all have stories. We all have um, beliefs and, and, um, and our own, our, our own ethos, and we can share that. And I think it's important to do it. Okay, very nice. Okay, so as we've talked about um, in the, the past few minutes, economies are changing, and so is the workforce. Does your advice still hold true for the next generations? And if not, what advice would you give to Generation Z? <laughs> uh, it does. This, this has to be, advice has to be both timely and timeless. Okay. T- timely in the sense that we're reacting to whatever is coming down the pike legislatively or in terms of the crisis du jour. But it also has to be timeless because it has to work no matter what. All right. If you're building a dam, you want that dam to hold no matter what. If it only holds on certain storms, you have a problem. Same thing's true with a financial plan. If it only works, if you don't have these events happen in your life, it's, it's, it's not set up to be perfect. And I recognize life's not a game of perfect and we're doing the best we can, but you have to have an all weather plan. It has to be prepared for things that you can't predict. I don't yes. know how many of us predicted a pandemic shutting down most of, the, most of the world for a period of time. None of us predicted that, or if we did, we didn't expect it to, to be this way. Remember, we were going to flatten the curve for two weeks. Right. Um, you know, great financial crisis. Looking back, it's obvious what happened with with money. But at the time, you don't see it until it's until it's easy to look back and see. Same thing with Y two K. We look at these crises, and they're created um, they're created at a time where we're all so focused on taking that next step forward that we haven't had a chance to digest. And when you look back, you're like, oh, duh. Of course, that makes perfect sense. But you don't ever see it coming. So. Um, I do think it's timeless advice. Brilliant. Absolutely. I think the, the point you made about we're so focused on the next thing. And then if the carpet gets pulled out from under us, we're like, oh. yeah. <laughs> where, did, where did that come from? <laughs> uh, uh, the, 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 the plan only works until it doesn't. Correct. Yes. And, and yeah. if you can't get it back on track, 
uh, once it stops working, you don't really have a plan. What you have is a house of cards. Yes. And I think more and more people are realizing that there are, there are unknowns that they have to plan for that they thought was, the, was so far away. And now it's coming to their doorstep and they thought that they were either insulated from it or that they were in a protected bubble. And now they're realizing. Uh... <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. And all of us like to like to talk about our castles, right? Our, our wealth, our homes, our businesses, our what? Nobody talks about the moat around the castle. Yeah. It, it doesn't get a lot of attention, but in the absence of a good moat or what we would call a good risk management plan, mm -hmm. um, in the absence of that, you're open to invaders. There's nothing to protect what you're building. Yes. Yes. In fact, uh, this is off topic, but I'll just throw this in our conversation this lovely morning. I was a part of a, a kind of a, a long discussion yesterday, and it brought up about how some affluent families are, are facing what's on the dark web. And that's not mm -hmm. something that they ever anticipated. And, right. and how easy it is to hack into somebody's cell phone, even if there is industrial VPN. So yeah. it, new surprises. Yeah. And I don't want to, I don't want to paint the world as scary. I just yeah. think mm -hmm. that there is that, that we live, we can't take the now for granted. We are all, uh, we're all subject to risks that we don't even fully understand. And that's again, not to make the world seem scary. I'm with you. Yes. Um, but the things that we have to talk about with clients are things we didn't talk about 20 years ago. Correct. Identity, identity theft and fraud management, credit monitoring, certain things that they just weren't thought of. They didn't seem important. Um, and, and in terms of what you leave behind, the biggest problem people have when they lose a loved one is dealing with passwords and all the nonsense uh, for all their accounts and everything's online. Correct. So, so it's, it almost shuts down your ability to access things. And it's such a, it's such an enormous time suck to have to sit on an 800 number and wait 45 minutes to talk to somebody to get something reset to say, here's what you need. You know, mom died and we've got to close her account. Right. Those right. kinds of things are, they are, uh, they are absolutely endless. And in the absence of having that, those passwords or access to that, I mean, it used to be, it was a safe deposit box. Right. And the big problem was people put uh, the people gave access to the safe deposit box and they put it in their will and then they put the will in the box. <laughs> you, you can't make that up. So so somebody says, mom died. I, I need access to the box. And they say, well, we, you don't have it. And they say, well, it's in the will. Well, where's the will? It's in the box. Well, we can't open the box to give it to you. Like people did this. And it's it's the same thing today with other kinds of there are other kinds of booby traps out there. And that's really what it is. Yeah, I think it's we don't think through the blind spots until we have to. Yes. So I'm going to. Yeah, gonna, yeah I'm going to make a joke before we move on to the next okay. question. If only right. we could just send the foyer request to the NSA. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Piece of cake. Piece of just cake. Just kidding. Yeah. Okay. And just like that, we've both been shut down. Well done. <laughs> that was the last they heard of either one of us. <laughs> All right. So speaking of the government. You've mentioned before that the government is broke. Do you believe, mm. <clears throat> would you want to speak on that for a moment before? No, I, I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you believe the general population is following the example of the government? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, are we robbing Peter to pay Paul? Yeah, some people are a lot. Okay. Um, the difference is that the government has a printing press and they can print money. Mm-hmm. And when they do, they devalue every dollar in our wallet. Correct. And we're and feeling so, that inflation. Well, and we're about to feel it more if they pass yet another multi-trillion dollar bill. Mm -hmm. it's, the, the problem is that everyone agrees on the need for certain things, certain basic things. Infrastructure is something I thought the whole planet could agree on. But now it's about how do you define infrastructure? And, there's, and, and the politics are so disgusting. Right. That people, the people have sort of tuned it out. That there's lots of reasons for that, and that's also beyond the scope of today's discussion. I realize, but um, the the government is is absolutely broke. Mm -hmm. um, they are they are mortgaging our futures, and the amount the national debt right now is so ridiculous. I mean, thinking about that many trillions of dollars, it's it's not possible to pay it back. Th yeah. This is not something. This is something that we're either going to carry that interest on our books for the rest of time, or we're going to default. It's a right. matter of when, and that's not to sound the alarm like it's coming tomorrow. Right. But at some point, you can't borrow your way out of debt. 
Yeah, it's interesting because uh, even what uh, last year when the power outages happened in Texas, and we'll go back to the, the yeah. questions in yeah, a moment, no. but it's just, it was a, a an eye-opening moment regarding the infrastructure, you know, not just like highways and and the, the the water dams. It's it's there's a lot of things that need attention that have not been that have been neglected. Yes, well, the, the the water system in our fair city is over a hundred years old. There are main breaks every day. It's just a matter of where. It's whack a mole. Yeah, and to replace that is a massive undertaking, a huge amount of money that that doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. And so we do have aging infrastructure. You look at some of the cities around the world that have been built more recently and they're modern and spectacular. And then you look at the ones that have been around a hundred plus years and they're, they're dilapidated. Yeah. Well, it'll be, it'll be interesting how the the future plays out. I'd like to think that there would be some type of solution where it would create jobs, get people back to work, get the infrastructure repaired and upgraded and you're smiling. What's that? Yep. Look? Well, I've already decided to vote for you. Just just run okay. on that platform. You have my vote. It's a great idea. Well, why didn't we come up with that? Yeah, I it, think it's, a, yeah, it's, I, I agree with you. It, at some point, we're going to figure it out or we're going to be in real trouble. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, America used to be I'd like to think it still is uh, the the shining beacon of hope. I think it depends who you ask. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll add this bit and then I'll go back yeah. to the questions. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I think that uh, I, I saw or I read somewhere that was it J.P. Morgan back in the time of the Depression. I think he gave his own money to kickstart the economy back. Now, I'm not saying that the families of the Federal Reserve need to volunteer their own assets, but I, I do mm-hmm. think it's an interesting conversation where is somebody going to spend, a, you know, two hundred million dollars on a yacht that's going to turn into a submarine? you know, like the Megaloo or whatever it's called, uh-huh. or, or, or can they give to something that will make them less worried when they step out their front porch into the world and, and not be worried about rioters or civil unrest. And, you know, but, you know, I can't volunteer how they would like to <laughs> allocate their funds. <laughs> like, like everything else, like everything else, it is a, it is a balancing act. Right. And, and, you know, the government plays a role in terms of tax policy. And charitable organizations play a, a huge role. And frankly, I think the nonprofit world is by far and away the best solution to most of this. Um, and public-private partnerships work. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you can get if you can get local businesses and local business leaders to work with local uh, political leaders and elected officials, you have a much better shot at getting things done because you have buy-in from sort of both sides of the house. And I don't mean yeah. that like the House of Representatives, but you have both both sides. Uh, of the conversation, and you can get so much more done. If the government forces something, it winds up feeling onerous to business. And and if if business tries to to push something, the government usually finds a way to to shut it down. <laughs> so so it's it's this weird thing where they need each other, but they dislike each other a lot of the time. Right. And and that yin and yang are important. Very much, very much so. Yeah. I'm just going to take a sip of coffee and move on to the next question. No problem. I absolutely agree. Um, and I'd like to see more win-win conversations for the future so that um, that can give hope for the millennials and Generation Z, because there is so much brilliant talent that's out there. And if, if applied correctly, could you know, make this world so much easier compared to the struggles of you know, what I call unnecessary trauma that I'm seeing playing out today. And it's played out before in other, in other decades and centuries, but obviously it feels more real because we're living in this time. It's not like we're reading about it in a history book. That's right. You're absolutely right. What and our, our own experiences are, you know, the, the folks who were in New York on 9-11 have a different feeling about it than the folks who are in Utah on 9-11. Absolutely. They, they just they just do. And that, that's neither right nor wrong. It's just different. The closer it hits to home. If you you know, I, I was in Oklahoma City and I went to the memorial there. And uh, it, first of all, it's a spectacular, amazing place. They did an amazing job and I encourage people to visit it's so powerful. It's, it's almost, it, it almost brought me to tears. It was amazingly done. But what I can tell you is that when that event occurred, it didn't hit home for me any more than if it had in Bangladesh. Yeah. It's, it's like, because I'd it. never been there. It was like seeing something uh, in a movie. In a movie. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if you were living it and if it affected your family and your friends and your community, it's, it's all, you know, I mean, that, that, that nothing could be more powerful or horrible. Yeah. So, it's like your, it becomes your experience. 
so our experiences are, are being crafted by what we, what we go through. And, you know, there was a generation, the depression changed um, uh, generations. We had a, a, a client once who, um, whose, whose parents, when they passed, they, they had, when they went through the basement of their parents' home, this is a true story, went through the basement of their parents' home and they found uh, on top of the hot water heater, or the furnace actually, on top of the furnace, there was a wad of cash. It must have been an inordinate amount of money, but it had been down there so long it had decayed and melted into nothing. I mean, it was wow. like mush. It had probably been there for 50 years wow. and it was probably a quarter of a million dollars, which when you think about it means that it would have been millions and millions and millions of dollars had it been invested, but it was sitting there melting because there was so much fear that you were going to need cash that they kept it in the house and they kept it on top of the furnace to try and keep it safe. Next to this furnace was a fireproof safe a fireproof safe. And when they finally were able to get into the fireproof safe, what they found were tablecloths from Italy. Yeah. So what do you value? This was the, the cash was considered less valuable to them. It was important to have, but it was less valuable than something that felt real and tangible from their own history. Yeah. The cash was never a giant. Uh, uh, it was an unbelievably unfortunate event, obviously, but, um, but it was a lesson learned. The cash is only worthwhile if someone will accept it as currency. As soon as they won't, it's paper. Yeah. Yeah. Worth the paper it's printed on. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Wow. The things that we can notice from a distance because, yeah, because in that moment, they're, they might not even be thinking clearly or they're thinking clearly and that's, that, that is their thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of uh, clear thinking, let's talk about the education system. Oh, yes. boy, you, boy, this is really uplifting. Is there, you know, <laughs> education system? Um, For what all would you the like millennials to... that are going to watch this video. Yeah, no, the, the education system is, is badly broken and in need of, of a lot of fixing. Um, okay. I know specifically you wanted to talk about the, the, the education around finance. Um, I and, did. And, and also yeah. my curiosity about what you're teaching your daughter. What I wanted to add to, to this question is I found it yeah. fascinating that maybe in the last 10 to 20 years, the Oprah magazine became educational books in overseas, not just in Africa, but 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 all over the world. So when a magazine now becomes a school book, you know, videos like this, like like what we're creating right now and other podcasts that you've been on or I've been mm -hmm. on are, are now becoming an educational tool, not just in the United States, but when I, I look at the numbers for, for my podcast, it's in the BRICS nations also. So people okay. in Brazil, India, China that are also English speaking will watch this video and, and they're learning from it. And it just shocks me. Well, if they're learning from the American education system, uh, they're, they're probably learning what not to do. Um, our education <laughs> system is, is broken badly. First of okay. all, we don't, we don't teach life skills anymore of any kind in most places. There are some exceptions to that. Mm -hmm. But you can finish you can finish high school in this country without being able to put together a coherent paragraph. You yeah. couldn't even write a letter to accompany your resume, much less to write a resume. Mm -hmm. That's embarrassing. You know, 100 years ago in this country, we were teaching people how to translate Latin into Greek. Now we're teaching them not to eat Tide Pods. I know. And that's so how much, far we've come. Right. And, and so much of the etymology of words is incredibly important to understand uh, the, the, the meaning behind it, the interpretation. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just, yeah, unless somebody is hungry enough that they will yeah, pursue it. Yeah. There, there was a, a major push in this country that essentially said everyone to be successful must go to college. And by doing that, they created enormous demand with limited supply and it increased the cost of education threefold, fourfold. Mm -hmm. At the same time, lessening the value. Because if everyone has the same degree, the degree is not a differentiator anymore. Yeah. So you make something three or four times more expensive and half as valuable. And at some point you say, well, why are we doing this? You know, for what, what it costs to go to an undergraduate school now for four years, depending on the aid and, endow and endowments and all that, what it costs to go to school, you could get yourself a franchise and start a profitable business tomorrow. I'm not saying everyone should. I'm saying people could, and there's no, you know, we've, we've destroyed this notion that there are lots of honest ways to make a good living. Mm -hmm. You know, trade trades, people make a phenomenal living and they are in demand and, you know, nurses, nurses, mm -hmm. there, there's such a need. 
Um, and, and that's one that requires a, a degree, but um, you know, to be, to be a, an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter, um, any of the trades, not only do you make a good, honest living, you often work for yourself and you don't have to take a hundred thousand dollar, two hundred thousand dollar student loan to do it. Yes. I think many of the millennials today actually want to work in the trades. I hope so, because it's difficult to get anything done and that we've, we've made it so that everyone for a whole generation went to undergraduate school and they took these bachelor degrees that, that really aren't valuable in most mm -hmm. cases. Um, and so now in order to differentiate yourself academically, it almost requires graduate school. Well, what that means is now it's not four years of school. Now it's five, six, seven years of school. You're in even more debt and you're older when you start working, which means you're that much further from financial independence. Correct. Correct. It's, it's, it's a problem. And, and kids are making decisions at 17 or 18 about Better. student loans. You know, I've often said it's ridiculous that these kids are, are old enough to make, uh, to borrow a quarter of a million dollars for an undergraduate degree in, in history, but they're not old enough to have a Budweiser on campus. Yeah. They're Makes signing no contracts and they have no idea what they're stepping into and, or Correct. how it's going to bind them in the future. Yeah. I've often made this joke to my parents, which they don't particularly like, but mm. the $70,000 Penn state education, if I could do it all over again. So it was between 1997 to 2000. And mm -hmm. if I could do it over again, I would have bought seven houses in Pennsylvania at that time mm -hmm. and had that $10,000 be the down payment for each of the seven mm -hmm. houses and then looped back like 20 years later when I mm -hmm. could appreciate what it was, mm -hmm. because at that time it was just, wow, look at this beautiful campus. Well, you went to Penn State and I went to UPenn. So we were we were both in the Commonwealth. Uh, I was uh, I'm a little older than you, but. Um, but what was spent on education, and I think my undergraduate ed education cost about $72,000 all in for four years. Well, now that's one year. Correct. Um, but, but it was, I think it was $18,000 a year or something at the time. And I was very fortunate. Um, my grandfather was a, 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 a renowned prosthodontist and a, a successful guy, a very charitable, kind human. Um, but he, he mostly paid my tuition. And so I, I didn't come out of school with loans, which was a big deal and a total blessing. And I, I realized that's um, that's almost like a unicorn these days to come out of school without without debt. Right, right. Well, kudos to your grandfather, you said. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So speaking of, of dads, right, what would mm -hmm. you like as a father to teach your daughter? Well, oh, gosh, that's a whether long it's list. about financial education, yeah. the, the whole life policy. Well, first and foremost, I want to teach her self-reliance and resilience. And that's true financially, but it's true in every way. I always want her to be in a position to be able to take care of herself and not to have to rely on other people. It doesn't mean don't rely on other people. We're a community, we're a family and so forth. But I want her to be self-sufficient. I want her to find something she loves to do so that it doesn't feel like work. It feels like life. Um, and, and I want her, obviously I want her to live an amazing life, but I want her to leave the planet better than she found it. You know, I, I want her to make a difference in people's lives, big or little every day. And I, I want her to, to love and have a joyful life doing something she loves and making a difference in whatever way she wants. Even, you know, if, if she wants to be a dancer professionally someday and, and, and she's bringing joy to people who, who watch her dance, it doesn't have to be rocket science. It could be anything, mm -hmm. you know? And so if she wants to be an architect, an accountant or a, or a, a ballerina, I, I don't care what she wants to do as long as she loves it and it brings her joy um, and it, it brings other people's, makes other people's lives better. Yes, that's lovely. Good, how nice. And I'm sure that you also bring some of these financial conversations home. I, I do, it's funny yes. because in most homes, money's taboo, people don't talk about it. <laughs> they don't, <laughs> they don't talk. <laughs> There's an enormous amount of embarrassment around money. There's shame and embarrassment and baggage around money. People who are wealthy feel embarrassed by their wealth. And some people who are worth more money than you can imagine think they could have done better and they aren't leaving enough. Like it, it is, there is no one, there's no right size. It's kind of like on the highway. Right. George, George Carlin used to say that the people passing him were, 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 and he used bad words for it, but he said the people passing him were going too fast and the people he, he got stuck by him were going too slow. And no one was going his speed. Right, 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 right. Well, it's the same financially. People are either better off than you are financially or worse off than you are financially. And there's this incredible baggage around it. People don't talk about it. And, you know, I want to empower my daughter. I don't want to ruin her. 
you know, the last thing I want to do, and I, I, I trust being that we're both uh, of similar generations. I trust, you know, the, the reference Billy Madison, the Adam Sandler movie. Okay. There was an Adam Sandler movie about a kid who grew up with all the money in the world and he became nothing and he sat around all day. Uh, and so they sent him back to school. It's very funny. It's not for kids, but it's very funny. <laughs> um, and at any rate, I don't want to ruin her. I mean, we're, right. we're, we're blessed. I, I make a, a, a very comfortable living and we're trying to, 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 to make um, philanthropy a part of her life. So every year, some of, of her allowance goes to charities that she selects. Some of it goes to long-term savings. She opened a bank account you know, it's, it's a little bit frustrating for me to show my daughter her bank statement, which has, you know, a couple hundred dollars in it, okay. when the interest for that quarter is a penny. Because it's reasonable for her to say, why would I do this? If I'm only earning a penny, I could have had fun with this money. And she's not right. wrong. And right. there's a lot of that. That is not, uh, that is not ridiculous. If you're not getting a return on your money, what's the point of having it parked someplace? And um, and, and I think we carry those things. So I needed to teach her that there will come a day where she needs that money for something different than she does now. Yeah. The rainy day fund. Yes. Well, and just, and just delayed gratification, which none of us are good at anymore. Right. Right. You know, if a, if a, if a, a piece of software takes 15 seconds to load, it might as well have been four days. Like I, what, what, <laughs> come on, let's go. Yeah. Like, you know, we, we used to wait. We used to, to wait somebody and then it was a phone call and now it's if you don't respond to my email in four minutes you're ignoring me oh yeah same thing with text yes uh, yeah oh yes. gosh if you don't answer a text you must not <laughs> like me anymore or perhaps i'm busy my phone is vibrating in my pocket now someone's texting me and going why haven't you answered well i'm i'm with angelina at the moment right right yeah i know the it's a great point about instant gratification compared to delayed, because I think so, some yeah. of those principles hold true, whether it was, you know, during the time of Samaria or today. And, and it's yeah. very hard when the, the, the water that we swim in, in our fishbowl or our goldfish bowl is, is um, you know, everyone is into gra instant gratification. And then if we feel like we're the one goldfish that says, no, I'm into delayed gratification. It's uh, well, <laughs> you know, they look at that goldfish a little differently. Yes. Well, and, and that comes back to your readings of Aesop's fables as a kid and the ant and the grasshopper. And if you don't remember that, I'll, I'll challenge you to look it up. I'm not sharing the story on your podcast, but um, you know, this whole idea that, that preparing for the future, I, I tell clients to live as though you might die today, but plan as though you might live forever. Because yeah. it, it, to, to, to be miserly and sack away every penny for, for later is a sad, sad way to spend your life. And that doesn't always happen. And you get sick or somebody dies and it doesn't. So I don't think it's, it's not wise to put away every penny mm -hmm. for some other day. It's also not wise to blow every dollar you make. Correct. There's, there's a middle ground where you can say, I'm, I'm using this portion of my income to preserve my dignity down the road. And I'm using the rest of it to enjoy my life because this isn't the dress rehearsal. Yes. Yes. And, and it's amazing the, uh, uh, the emotions that are behind it. And again, before I ask you about your legacy when we, and we're going to close out, but I just want to add that I think that the, the conversations that we're having right now are important because if people aren't talking about money, then they're not going to understand that there is a, an alternative route other than all or nothing. <laughs> yeah. It, it was seldom is all or nothing. The right answer. Yeah. I mean, I, in any any walk of life, it's rare that it's a hundred or zero. Yeah, I know. And the human brain likes to conserve calories, and this is the invitation for people to become creative and not just fall back into what's easy. Well, my my whole body conserves calories. That's that's a topic for another day too. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah. in respect to, to your time, I know that we have an hour today. Yeah, yeah. So wh what would you like your personal legacy to be? That, that is such a profound question. And, I, and I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret, which is I'm turning 50 next month. And 50 is hitting me in a different way than any other birthday. Because it feels like for certain I'm entering the back nine. You know, I, I think 100 is a good round number. I'm hoping to be here till 100. But that means that I'm definitely on the on the back nine, right? And so it's got me thinking a lot about what not only how I want to spend my time and um, and my energy, um, but also how I want to be remembered, and not in some tragic way, but in a thoughtful way. Uh, and and I would say that I, I have I have two legacies that are uh, sort of the easy paths. One is this business that I truly believe will outlive me and will thrive 
for a very long time um, without me, which is any entrepreneur's dream. Uh, and the second is I have a spectacular, amazing middle school kid who is the future of our family tree because she's an only child. And so I believe I have a family legacy and I believe I have a professional legacy. Um, and beyond that, I, I just want to leave the world a better place than I found it. I want to make a difference on even micro levels every day if I can. And if I do that, the summation of all those little goodwills are going to add up to something profound. Very nice. And what values do you get to honor? Just a... Well, one of them is, is integrity. You talked about that before. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, I value um, or the value that I honor the most is integrity. You can, you can take me for my word. And if, uh, if that's not true, um, or if I, if I deviate from that, then I've, I've really, um, I, I've, I've cheated myself and I've betrayed myself. Yes. I also love the fact that you are giving that respect to your life and to your time and to other people's lives. I, I love what I do. Yeah. I'm very lucky. And, and, and I have an amazing life that, that I'm very fortunate to have. And I've worked ridiculously hard and still work more hours than most humans. But I love what I'm doing. And I feel like every day I'm making a difference. And as long as that's true, as long as I feel like I'm a, a valuable component, not only to the company, but to the people we serve, the longer I want to do it. And if there comes a day where that's where then I'm going to need to find my next adventure and that'll be okay too when the time comes. Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Brotman, Eric, uh, for your time this morning and for sharing your knowledge about financial planning and wealth management and all of the different aspects that come with um, understanding our journey, whether it's our past and what we can do, what we can't do, what we need to be realistic about all of it. So I appreciate it so much. And what's the best way if a listener or a viewer would like to learn more about you and your business? Uh, the best way is to go to brotmanmedia.com. That's where you'll find our podcasts and books and online courses and, and resources. Uh, and the, the company is BFG Financial Advisors, which is bfgfa.com. Very nice. Well, thank you so much, Eric. And I appreciate your time once again. And for all of the listeners and the viewers out there, please like, subscribe, and share with your friends and family. And until next time, keep defining, developing, and executing your legacy. Thank you so much for joining.